foot. Hudson, hut. Element one, report. It doesn't become four, sir. Element two, report. Pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Seats. Okay, guys, uh, welcome today. Uh, we are in the ninth week of our quarter. Uh, please remember today is the day to turn into community service, uh, 1st of October. Uh, in this class, we'll be uh, having our final leadership laboratory here this afternoon, as well as our in-house class. We'll be taking our, our aerospace science test, Chapter 3, Lesson 123, this Wednesday. Don't look lost. <laughs> all the grades, uh, you know, I get on top of the grades. All the grades will be final Thursday afternoon. Friday's going to be a PE day uh, with Colonel DeKemper. I will not be here. Okay. Uh, today we're very blessed to have a different uh, instructor for you. I met him at the VA. He was there uh, helping out. And this is uh, Mr. Uh, McDonald. I'm sorry. Bill Dunsmore. Dunsmore. I'm sorry. I was like Dunsmore oh. work. Dunsmore. Yes, sir. He is actually having quite a varied 20-year Air Force career. And he's going to talk about some things that uh, he did that actually we do in different ways now with computers and technology. Uh, so please give you his attention, and you've got a lot of show and tell, and uh, we'll be going straight through to the bell rings, okay? Thank you, sir. Good. Glad to be here this afternoon, share a little bit with you. If I get out of breath, don't worry about it. I've got the concentrator over here giving me oxygen, and uh, I'll to explain why that's on there. I was born in uh, February of 1941. And that's just prior to uh, Pearl Harbor being attacked by the Japanese. My dad was a, went into the Marine Corps, was in the Pacific, was wounded, and came back. I was uh, born and raised actually in Austin, Minnesota. Went through high school in Minnesota, in Austin. And uh, while I was there, uh, you're going to find several common themes in, in, throughout your life. And when you're talking with people or when you're doing it, I interview people also, and uh, just like what you're doing here. And you're going to find common themes, and you'll find a common theme that I found in mine as such. But I start out, uh, when my dad came back being wounded, he, he worked with the Veterans Administration. And I was helping servicemen coming back as such. And that's carrying a carry over in my lifetime, and I've carried that on. Um, while I was going through Austin High School, I went to uh, several uh, camps uh, for the, during the summer. It was basically a canoe camp up on the Minnesota-Canadian border uh, out of Duluth, Minnesota, Grand Marais. And uh, really got started, enjoyed doing that to the point for four years, four summers, I became a canoe guide in the Minnesota-Canadian border. And I really learned how to read maps. Uh, this is kind of a, what a, a canoe, uh, canoe camp uh, or canoe map is with all of just a few of the lakes of the 10,000 lakes in Minnesota. But this is coming up the Grand, out of Grand Marais off of Lake Superior, up, up to Gunflint Trail, up to uh, the camp that we were at. And then we take the groups out for a week to two weeks at a time, uh, portaging from one lake to another, canoeing across that lake, portaging over to the next one. We go out for uh, one to two weeks at a time and see nobody else during that whole period of time. So this, learned, is, this is a guide. It wasn't necessarily just in uh, Boy Scouts or anything. No, no. Okay, that's great. So I was a guide for four years and uh, ended up, after I met my wife, I'll get into that in a minute, but uh, we honeymooned up here also. That's cool. <laughs> so I got to close up the camp one year huh. as such. But this is how I learned how to read maps. And that kind of led into how I became a and I'll, as I'll mention it in a few moments, but uh, we'll get into something. Here's another example of the uh, types of uh, maps you get. And you can see the, all of the different uh, uh, contour lines and the different things. And we'll get into some of those things. But uh, I uh, <clears throat> went, well, also during my summers, I worked with Civil Air Patrol. 
and we were out at the airport a lot, and uh, that's how I kind of started. And there's a reason for ha explaining that, because that has covered th common themes from my lifetime, using civil air patrol uh, as such. Uh, was started out as a uh, cadet, went on into the seniors because I advanced in the, into the senior group, and as such, and. Uh, uh, that kind of led me into the Air Force side of the house. Uh, one of those years, we went down on a Minnesota encampment down at Scott Air Force Base, Illinois. And in turn, while we were there for two weeks, that's where I met my fiance, or met my bride-to-be, and uh, invited her to come up to the canoe camp with me for one summer. I was going to be the guide up there, and she was going to come. I had her come up with a group out of Austin. And uh, when you uh, go out for two weeks at a time, you learn to see a person's personality real quick. <laughs> and uh, sometimes when it rain and the, everything and such. But Civil Air Patrol and the uh, care a lot for me. That led me into the Air Force, uh, such. Uh, finished up my uh, degree. I went over to Mankato State College. It's now the University of Minnesota, uh, Mankato. And I uh, spent my last two years there and uh, got a bachelor's degree in geography, uh, an art minor, and a cartography minor. Now, for those of you who don't know what a cartographer is, that's the person who actually draws the maps. It might be anywhere from 10 to 20 plates, different colored plates, from the road map, road plate to the water plate to the, uh, the, the uh, car. Uh, contour plates, all the different friskets that they put on them, and such. Uh, my first assignment in the Air Force, I, I volunteered to go into the Air Force. I decided at that point to, to made a, a career uh, move that I wanted to go into the Air Force. Uh, volunteered to go into cartography, since that led over because of geography and uh, art and my cartography background. And they accepted me from that. My first assignment was at Langley Air Force Base, Virginia. Or excuse me, it was Lowry Air Force Base. I'll get it right. Where's Lackland Air Force Base? Lackland Air Lackland, Force Base. Lackland, down in Texas. Actually, we were over in the officer training school for about three and a half months. I was down there, and uh, for those of you who remember when uh, in uh, October of uh, 1963 when Kennedy was killed. I was at Lackland, actually Medina, when that happened, as such. We came out, I was, I was commissioned uh, as second lieutenant in the uh, United States Air Force in February of 64. My first assignment was at Shaw Air Force Base, South Carolina. I came in there as a cartographer. The first uh, assignments that we were doing, this was right after the Cuban Missile Crisis, we were taking all the photography that had been overflowing of Cuba and were making mosaics, both controlled and uncontrolled mosaics, taking that photography, using that to update the 200 series nautical charts. Because we were un under the impression at that time we may be invading Cuba. And they needed an updated charts, so we used all the new photography they'd gotten to in order to uh, update all that. So you actually had to take old-timey photography on um, original satellites or, or uh, tactical reconnaissance. See, yeah, uh, reconnaissance. see um, the, they were basically using the uh, uh, U-2 and the um, uh, 101 Voodoos, uh, RF-101 Voodoos that overflow in Cuba and using that photography to make the controlled mosaics and then in turn, we use those to, to give it our scale to actually do the charts uh, as such. That was my first assignment, was at Shaw Air Force Base. I was there for about a year and a half. My unit moved to Langley Air Force Base, Virginia, and we were building a new reconnaissance technical squadron group there. Uh, they said we saw the handwriting on the wall, that uh, the old hand scribing, of the contour lines and everything that we were doing by hand was going digital, was going into computers. We didn't know what computers were at the time, uh, but we saw that the 
that they were getting rid of a lot of cartographers, the old hands scribing and stuff. So they said, uh, recommended that I get into pho photography, precision photography, since I had a background in it also. So they sent me out to Lowry Air Force Base in Colorado for three months for training in precision photo processing. We did a lot of that. Uh, got my training, came back to Langley, Virginia. Bought my first house there. My down payment was 16, it's not, my down payment, <laughs> my home mortgage was $16,900. For a house? For a house. What year was that? That was in 1965. Yeah. <laughs> Can't even buy a car for that these days. <laughs> Is that middle class? That was middle class. That was That's middle class. Military, military middle class. But it was a great place. We were there for like four years. But during that time, uh, I had an opportunity while we uh, worked with uh, many different camera systems. We were right at, at, uh, at Langley Air Force Base, Virginia. But right across the runway was NASA. And they were sending up, uh, f they were bringing back photography of the moon at that time. One weekend, they had some, their, some of their processing equipment broke down, so they asked us if we would help process some of their film. We got some of the first films coming back from the moon of where the landing sites were going to be for the astronauts later on. Very cool. So, Very cool. So that kind of cemented that side of it. I also had an opportunity working with a brand new camera system by uh, uh, iTech and Fairchild, and uh, it was very hush-hush at the time. Uh, only about uh, half a dozen people knew about it. Uh, they would call us out. We'd uh, install the camera, install the film. Uh, even to this day, I can't tell you where it, went, where it was installed and what, but we, uh, we installed it. They'd call us back a couple days later. We uh, took the film out of the camera, processed it, and uh, it disappeared from there, but we were learning and working with a brand new camera system. Uh, two years later, I saw that same camera system when I went to Vietnam. So they were building that camera system for a medium altitude panoramic system. I volunteered for Vietnam, and previously to that I was in tactical <coughs> command, or better known as TAC, at, in South Carolina and Virginia. I went, uh, volunteered and said to Vietnam, uh, because of my security clearance, there was only one place I could go, and that was at Tan Son Ut in Saigon, Vietnam. Uh, they put me into tactical reconnaissance with my background that I had. Uh, better known as PACAF, Pacific Air For uh, Command Forces, and, uh, and tactical reconnaissance. We were using a fairly modern aircraft at the time. If you wanted to like to show that. This is an F-4, but we were using the reconnaissance version of it. And uh, that reconnaissance F-4 had anywhere from uh, uh, six to 12 different camera systems on it, uh, from uh, forward-looking radar, infrared, uh, side of like, uh, panoramics. We would take out film, load the film into the, into the camera, into the cassettes, load the cassettes onto the cameras in the, in the different aircraft. Uh, they go out, fly their missions, come back, we download it, process it, uh, in a, what's called a PPIF, or Precision Photo Processing Interpretation Facility, and uh, do the photo interpretation of it with it. And uh, you're familiar with the 35 millimeter film, right? Maybe a bus trip about uh, that They long. don't know what 35 millimeter 35 is. 35 millimeter is? No. You're all, it's all digital. Okay. Uh, explain how long it took to take a camera picture and get the results. That's what they, they <laughs> Okay. Uh, we would have anywhere, as I said, from four to four to six, normally four to six rolls of film. We had five inch wide and nine inch wide film. 500 feet long to 1,000 feet long in the photo processing. We'd be processing maybe from one mission, we'd have, as I said, anywhere from four to six, seven uh, rolls of film processing, all going through at different speeds, different processing, different for infrared versus the uh, uh, photography. We interpreted it using the raw uh, negatives, right from the negative itself. Because anytime you go from a negative to a positive, in other words, a, a, a photo print, 
you lose about 50% of your resolution because of the, uh, of the paper. So we would pro do our reconnaissance interpretation right from the negatives itself. Uh, in Vietnam with that, we could go down using the infrared at night, for example, we could uh, spot little f campfires down there in a, in a grouping in a truck park or something like that. How high were the pictures taken? Anywhere from uh, 200 feet to uh, maybe uh, 1,000 feet. So again, guys, these are not satellites. These are, these are planes just like the Tactical cores, reconnaissance. You know, going fast and having cameras up inside of it. And then after the cameras are taken, you have to come out with the rolls of film and have professionals like him interpret it. And it, it took a long time. Of course, back then, they thought it was really cool. <laughs> I mean, that was, that was the wave of the future. It was amazing. <laughs> yeah. But nothing like we have real time now. But we could de determine, based on how many campfires are down there, and there, we could pretty much determine how many uh, enemy combatants were in that area. We would call in airstrikes based on those campfires, and they would come in and hit that, that uh, truck park, for example, as such. Did that for a year, from 68 to 69. Unbeknownst to me at the time, I was exposed to Agent Orange, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. That's why I've got this, this little guy hanging on here with me right now. Uh, such. We'll get into that a little bit further. Uh, from there, since I volunteered for Vietnam, I also I said, well, where do you want to go next? My tour was one year, so I said, well, I'd like to go to Germany. Well, uh, so I got a concurrent overseas tour. They got me to the United Kingdom, or England. Again, in tactical reconnaissance. Where in the uh, United Kingdom? I was at Upper Hayford, England, just north of Oxford, England. Let me uh, show them where this is on the big scheme of things okay. here. The big screen. We were there for about four and a half months, and then my unit moved to. Why don't you get that? Okay, so here's London down here on the bottom. Okay. Upper There's Hayford, Upper Hayford right up there. Right. Yep. And uh, actually, that base is closed down right now. Yep. And uh, the one that I flew out was Lake Heath, which is right here near Cambridge, right here. So it's all amazing. It's been paid to go to England and live there. How long were you there? I was there for four and a half months. That's not bad. My, my unit uh, was, uh, they had both 101 Voodoos and RF Force uh, Phantoms in there. My unit then moved to Zweibrück in Germany which is right on the French border, just under Saarbrücken. And I was there for five years. Oh, let me get that one. How do you spell that? Uh, Z Zweibrücken? Zwei, Z-W-E-I. Brücken. B-R-U-C-K-N. Yes. How do you know my What? How do you know my I am 71, almost 72. About a third of your life was spent in the Air Force. A little less than a third of your life was spent with the Air Force. I didn't catch that a little less than 30 of your life was spent in the Air Force? Uh, yeah. I think it was time well spent. Did you like it? Very much so. If I had a choice to do it, do it, definitely do it again. <laughs> I saw a lot. I did a lot. Some things I still can't talk to it, tell you about. <laughs> See, they're just realizing this is my 30th year in the Air Force, and I'm 52, so I've spent... 60% of my life <laughs> yeah. in the Air Force. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of classified stuff in these kids I can't talk about either, right? Right. <laughs> like Colonel was saying, uh, I believe it was a few weeks ago, he's like, I know all the secrets of the Air Force. I know all the loopholes, and the school won't trust them with the key to the well, locker room. <laughs> I, I know, I'm, I'm uh, because of my background as you're saying in here, I had a top secret code word security clearance myself. And uh, there's some things that will go to the grave with me that are, and that I can't even tell my wife or kids or anybody because uh, of the classification. But while I was in Germany, I had an opportunity. Um, my wife went through and got learned German lessons, learned how to speak German. I went, went, went through and got my master's degree and, uh, with the, from the University of Southern California. And I got it in aerospace operational management. Uh, about three quarters of the way through it, they changed the code to systems management. So it was this, uh, a um, master of science 
and systems management is what I graduated with. But uh, it's very important to get your degrees and continue on. There's stepping stones that will lead you into other opportunities. From Since I volunteered for Germany or overseas, uh, I saw the handwriting on the wall. Vietnam War was winding down. This is 1974. I saw the handwriting on the wall that we were going to be getting out shortly. A rift, reduction in force was coming. I wanted to stay in. That was my, one of my goals was to stay in uh, to the Air Force and make a career out of it. So I volunteered for a critical career field. And I volunteered for SAC, Strategic Air Command. Uh, I volunteered to get into the Minuteman as a Minuteman uh, launch control, missile launch control officer. And they said, Grand Forks, why Grand Forks? And I said, well, I was born and raised in Minnesota. Grand Forks just across the border. And I'm gonna let, the, I've been out of the States for seven years, I'm gonna let grand, my, the grandparents find out what grandkids are all about. By that time I had three. <laughs> uh, so we uh, went up to Grand Forks, North Dakota, settled my wife and kids. I moved, went out to Vandenberg uh, for three months for training, came back, was put on one of the missile details. Uh, in that four years I was up there, I put over 400, actually 402 alerts under North Dakota <laughs> and uh, over 50 simulator rides, about one a month, where we actually did tier and keys. The interesting thing that we have with Minuteman, and I'll get into a little bit more on the Minuteman missiles, uh, each Minuteman missile had up to three nuclear warheads on it. Each missile had a greater destructive capability than all the bombs that were dropped in World War II by both Allied and Axis powers, including Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Those were atomic bombs. We had up to three nuclear warheads. They could launch. It would uh, tell you a little bit more about that. We could have an opportunity to, as a commander, like I was, I had a deputy who was probably a a second lieutenant or first lieutenant at the time. We would go down for anywhere from 24 to 48 hours at a time underground, about 100 feet below ground in a uh, closed off cocoon. We would change over with the previous crew. They would go home. We would stay downstairs the whole time. They would uh, bring us our meals. We had a, a, a security crew upstairs, topside. We had a cook up topside. He'd get us a bit, bring us meals. Yes. Oh, I, I just had a question. I've never understood which is more powerful, atomic or nuclear? Nuclear. Okay. Hydrogen, actually. Hydrogen. Hydrogen is powerful than both. Yeah. Well, nuclear is basically which is atomic. Atomic and, and hydrogen call, call them under nuclear. But uh, your atomic bomb was the first ones that were dropped in Hiroshima yeah, and Nagasaki. Since that time, they've developed the uh, hydrogen bomb. But we could, we had an opportunity, if we had launched, you would have this, what we call a bus at the time. It's the, the top of the warhead, uh, which looks like this. It's a Titan, but it gives you the same idea on that. Here, why don't you let me okay. put that up there for them. And that warhead would, be, would travel, once you key turn on it, and it launches, there's no destruct capability. You aren't recalling it. You can't destroy it. It's gone. It would launch about 5,000 miles downrange. In our case, from North Dakota, it would go over the North Pole, and we were targeting Soviet Union at the time. And there are many targets. Yes? Um, what are all those, those little panel-looking things surrounding? All those what? The panel, the things that look like the panels. panels. Those little boxes. That, that was the inside of the tube. See, this is the this is the missile that is 103 feet tall, looking down into the ground, and those are that's the inside of the tube that it's at. So those are just like supporters. No. No. We would we would have uh, our launch control site. Now this is a Titan. Uh, we were at Minuteman. We had these. I had direct control of 10 missiles. I had indirect control of 40 additional ones, total 50 in our squadron. And we would have, we, we could check, pull the status up on all 50 missiles, but I had direct control of 10 of those. But, but what he was saying, the, these, these little curved things 
fold no. down and hold the missile in place before you shoot it. But these are some of these are racks yeah, for, for communication. It's so very sexy. Come down just so you can rep, you can walk out there and do maintenance. Yeah. So you had control of 150 nuclear warheads. Is what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> no joke. No joke. Here's some of the here's some of the shots there we got behind wow. you there. Did you, one of those is fired? Uh, you do testing, yeah. Oh, it doesn't mean it has nuclear weapons on it, but you're testing. What they would do is they would come in uh, a a uh, uh, inspection team would come in. They would do kind of like a bingo game if you want to think of it, and they'd select one missile, and pull that and go out, retrieve the warhead off of it, pull the missile out of the silo, transport it and the crew and the maintenance out to Vandenberg. That crew and, van and team, they would put, reinstall it in one of the tubes out in Vandenberg, which is a launch control site. They would put, in place of the warhead, they would put a instrumentation package and a destruct capability down the raceway. So if it decided to launch and start going towards Los Angeles, they could destroy <laughs> it if they had to. But those are the only ones that had the destruct capability on them. Uh, they would launch that down from uh, Vandenberg, downrange, to the Marshall Islands, uh, the Kujalan Atoll is about 5,000 miles away. That atoll is, think of it like an island with a lagoon in the middle. Where that instrumentation package landed in the lagoon, I'll show you how what the accuracy was. It was not re reconnected or anything else. It was launched and it went. I'm going to show this uh, on the uh, screen about you're talking about how they. How do you practice with something that goes 5,000 miles? Well, the way they practice is uh, like the screen here. You would shoot it from Vandenberg Air Force Base, which is right here where my hand is, and then it would go across the entire Pacific, okay, 5,000 miles. And where would it land? To the Marshalls. Oh, in Marshall Kujalli. Islands. And yeah. you land out here, okay? So how do you practice with something that goes 6,000 miles? It's almost halfway across the world. Oh, yeah. Well, it's a quarter. It's 224,000 miles around the equator. This is over a quarter mile, quarter times around the Earth. But guess what? Where's our targets? If he's sitting up here in Minnesota, okay, his target is over the poles and down here in Russia. So this is serious stuff. At the same time, he and Colonel DeKemper were sitting at the bottom of the tube waiting to shoot these missile man, Minuteman missiles. What else was, what were the other two parts of the strategic triad? What else was happening? Do we have any other nuclear bombs ready to go? Uh, I see the Well, he is. That's the intercontinental ballistic missiles. Oh, this is. Okay. That's but this is the other part. When he's sitting in the ground, he also had airborne nukes 24-7 like this on B-52s ready to be shot. So what if the Russians shot missiles and killed everybody on the ground, didn't matter a bit. You had airborne B-52s with nukes ready to be shot over the pole any time. And then the third part of the triad are nuke, our Navy. And submarines under the oceans all over the world ready to shoot any time. So it was a strategic triad, three different ways to shoot these nukes. So they had, they had to simultaneously take out air, air land, and sea. And there was no way for them to do it. And they That's couldn't find the submarines. They didn't know where they were. That's what I'm saying. It's kind of hard to find a submarine. Now, we knew that they knew we were a target. We knew we were a target for the launch control site. However, they would have had to take out our launch control center and all 50 missiles in, okay, that we had. They weren't spaced together. No, no, no. They were, we were anywhere. Our launch control sites, we had in, in the, our squadron in our... A missile wing at, at uh, uh, Grand Forks. We had uh, three squadrons. Each squadron has five launch control centers. So there's 15 launch control centers where the uh, crews are. Around each launch control center, you had uh, 10 additional missiles. So there's, and basically, there's five additional ones there. So you've got basically. 15 launch control centers with 10 missiles each. That's 150 missiles right at Grand Forks. We also had another 20 uh, launch control centers over at Minot, North Dakota. 
if Grand Forks and if North if North Dakota ever had succeeded from the United States and become the third world's largest nuclear power. <laughs> but we we had an opportunity, as I said, and each missile that we had had a greater destruct capability than all the bombs that were dropped in World War II. Wow. They're just devastating. Now, what do you do to launch it? We would receive a a uh, authenticated a message would come in over we had about six different ways of receiving the messages we would authenticate the message or do that we'd go we had a box a safe that i had my combination on and my deputy had a box i had a com his combination on it we would go up unlock the box pull out i pull out my authenticator and key he'd pull out his authenticator and key uh i was sat sitting in my console about from me and my deputy was about as far away as you are over there, so I couldn't reach. Yes, to, you couldn't do it at the same time. Couldn't do it at the same time. We both insert keys, I break open my authenticator, I say I have an authenticated message. My deputy says, I concur, I have an authenticated message. In that message, we would have date time groups, and they would have certain information in there of, of launching information that we would have. They have three different capabilities of, of a missile detonating. You have the airburst, which would take out a lot of communication. You had a surface burst, which could take out a lot of, and it was pick up a lot of the dirt and the dirt, make a dirty bomb out of it. It would take out a lot of uh, aircraft and everything else. And you had a subsurface burst, which would be like a command post before it would go in and plow into the dirt, and take out, go down about 100 feet, and then blow. Uh, as I said, we were in the area. So you can imagine these hundreds and hundreds of warheads, missile warheads, coming in to, say, the Soviet Union. And you don't want one taken out blowing, whereas another one's coming in because it would take out its own missile, and then the next warhead. So we had what's called the PSYOPs, single integrated uh, nuclear uh, uh, protection plan. So one would blow off, then the next one would come in and blow but they were all timed to, to hit different places. We didn't know exactly what the target was, but it, what it would take is uh, my deputy and I, would, we would do a countdown. We'd both count down to three, two, one, key turn, one, two, release. Yeah, it was a, a uh, on the key. That put one bolt in the system. Two other officers at another command post were also key turning at the same time. That put a second boat in the system. So four individuals. So that's your check and balance that they had. But if those two boats got in the system, those missiles are starting to ripple off. All different times, different places. Wow. And you got World War, and there's no recall on them. If our command post had been taken out, the missile says, I don't see anything else, they would start rippling off. All automatic. So it's mutually assured destruction, mad with the Soviet Union. That's why they never shot at us. Because they didn't want to get shot. Yeah, exactly. They knew, because if they do mutually knew. assured destruction. Nowadays, with the terror terrorists, God bless you, you don't have one country as a target. They the next. Yeah, they can have one terrorist come blow up a nuke in the Los Angeles port, and who do you target? So it's kind of a different world now. We don't have the mutually assured destruction as we did during the Cold War. Okay, it'll be a hot war before there's not a Cold War. <laughs> but it was a lot of responsibility when you realize what, you're, what you've got a capability to do. About a lot of pressure. Okay. You were a director of intelligence here? I, I'll get to that in just a second, in about a couple minutes. Uh, but at, there I also worked with intelligence up at Grand Forks, uh, as such, but basically we, we kind of knew what we're, where our targets were. If it was going to be an airburst, we could know that they were probably going after communication sites and locations. If it was a subsurface burst and it was right out near the, a, uh, a fjord or something like that, it's probably going to be a submarine pen or something like that. Or if it was in, in the middle of, of uh, uh, Russia and the Soviet Union, probably a command post. Uh, if it was a surface burst, then it's probably going to be a, a, a air base or something like that, or another type of, of uh, army post or something like that to be taken out, command post and stuff. But because I volunteered to get in the sack, I could also get out of it after a four-year control tour. 
I had an opportunity to become, go back to my intelligence field. I selected that, I liked that. And I was given a, a dual hat position at McGuire Air Force Base, New Jersey. And that was where my last assignment was. And that was in military lift command. Now I've been at Tactical Air Command, PACAF, USAFE, SAC, and now I'm going to MAC. There's five major commands with five different uh, backgrounds that I had. Cartography, precision photo processing, tactical reconnaissance, uh, missile launch commander, and now they gave me an opportunity to become the director of intelligence at 21st Air Force at McGuire Air Force Base. As I said, it was a dual hat position. I was working at the numbered Air Force, 21st Air Force, and as the 438th military left wing. In that position, we worked with uh, C-5 Galaxy aircraft. We worked with C-141 C1, C1, uh, Starlifters and C-130 Hercules uh, aircraft. And uh, moving uh, troops, forces, equipment all over the world. We were responsible from Mississippi River East uh, all the way over to India. Uh, 22nd Air Force, which is out at, at, uh, at Travis Air Force Base, was responsible for, for the Pacific side of the house. Uh, we flew into 110 countries a year. 80 of those countries had no one terrorist groups. This was in the 70s and 80s time. So you talk about terrorism today, we had a lot of terrorism at that time too. Groups that you've never even heard of, but I did. As I said, we had 80 different known, known terrorist groups. My job was to know the modus operandi of the different groups and brief the crews before they went in, debrief the crews before they came out. And uh, I'd go in and uh, get up about four in the morning, be in there by five. I'd read through a stack of classified message traffic that had come in for anywhere from uh, secret to top secret code word. Uh, prepare four different classified briefings and start at eight o'clock doing my briefings. And uh, some cases, I uh, couldn't let the right hand know what the left hand was doing or vice versa. But we had to brief the crews on certain things. Again, a lot of them only had secret clearances. When you ha talk about security clearance, you talk about unclassified material, then confidential, then secret, then top secret, and on top of that, you have what's called code worded categories. And you have a need to know. And you're only briefed in on those categories that you have a need to know on. You might be briefed in and then debriefed on certain things. And there are other things that were going on over here in the top in the category I didn't, wasn't even read in on uh, such. I worked for a two-star general, uh, General Sadler. And uh, he was very impressive. Uh, he gave standing orders to his secretary that said, anytime Major Dunsmore walks in with a, into his office with a briefcase in his hand, uh, let him in my office. I don't care who's in here. He might have another, be briefing another two-star general in there. He'd ask the other general to leave. I'd give him a quick briefing on what he had. And in turn, he'd say, okay, we'll be, meet up in your office. My office in the vault was the only thing that could, we could talk, cla certain classified areas. He'd say, get the Colonel Landers, the uh, deputy operations, get the, the maintenance officer and, and the logistics officer down in your major office. Time, huh? You were a major at the time. I was a major at the time. Fil holding a lieutenant colonel slot, but it was still a briefing area uh, slot. Uh, enjoyed that position thoroughly. Had a lot of TDYs, temporary duty assignments, out of that position. We had uh, Air Force Intelligence Service uh, reservists come in for their two week, their two week assignment. They would backfill my slot as I went out, and, and I and several of my people out for exercises or for real world contingencies. Uh, one of those I can tell you about, uh, we went on an exercise, a two week exercise to Jordan, uh, where we were out in the desert briefing the crews. Uh, the, the Jordanian, our, our air crews were briefing and working with the Jordanian air crews. We were eating uh, MREs, meals ready to eat for breakfast, lunch, and supper. Uh, one day we had King Hassan. That's not Saddam Hussein. King Hassan was the king of Jordan. He came in. Uh, he was a little, he's only stood about five foot. He's a fighter pilot, former fighter pilot. Very, a lot of respect for him. I got an opportunity to brief him three times. And he was so impressed with our briefings and what the interaction that the Air Force was doing. He invited us to have to dine with him that evening. 
He had a complete, remember, we're out in the desert. He had a complete meal brought in from Amman, Jordan, out in the desert. So we ate breakfast, MREs for breakfast and lunch, and then we got to dine with the king that evening. Uh, How many kids had eaten with the king? <laughs> Not very many. We had about 20 people there of our, of our U.S. Air Force that was doing that. Wow. But now my job was to brief the crews on uh, tactics and, and habits and things that you do and not do in front of the king. Uh, you'd, you eat, eat with your right hand only, no silverware. You eat standing up. Uh, you use your hands, your right hand only. Your left hand is considered the unclean hand. So we just told him, oh, take, I take your hand, take your hand, stick it in your, in your, in your belt bit behind you, and <laughs> like that. Why they say, yeah. Your unclean hand. Yeah. It'll come to you if you don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, don't sit down in a chair because if you do something like this, you're insulting him. Uh, sure. Something as simple as that. Sure. Show him the heel. It's like give him the, the, the bird sign, flip him the bird sign. So we had to brief the crews on certain things and tactics and things. But uh, those are some, a few of the side lists that, that we did. Uh, but as the director of intelligence, I had access to a lot of things that a lot of people didn't know about. Uh, we had a military at, at McGuire Force Base. We had our primary uh, aerial port there uh, where we were bringing, sending things overseas to, the, to Europe primarily and to Africa. We had a uh, reserve unit there and a guard unit. Uh, we also had an Iranian aerial port there. And I don't know if you remember, we had an opportunity for the, uh, when the Shah was in, uh, once a week they would have their crews come back from Iran to pick up the parts that had been purchased in the United States at that aerial port and go out. And I won't go any further than that, but we had an opportunity to get raw intelligence from some of their crews when they came in. We knew when the Shah was coming out as such and where he was going. And I was, brief, I was passing that information along to certain intelligence agencies. So we had raw data coming and going all the time as such. I put 20 years in the Air Force. My daughter followed my footsteps in the Civil Air Patrol. She enjoyed some of the things I could tell uh, as such. And in turn, because of that, uh, she went on and went, went into, when she came out of high school, uh, decided that she wanted to go into uh, to the Civil Air Patrol. Uh, she went and came out here to, to Emory Riddle Aeronautical University here in Prescott. That's how we found Prescott. Question? Uh, can you tell us about your experience, your encounter with Agent Orange? That yes. When I was, as I said, when I was in Vietnam, I was uh, exposed to Agent Orange, unbeknownst to me. Uh, they were using it for defoliants around the, because we were right on the flight line, in the taxiways. They were using it right around the hooch to keep where we were sleeping, uh, to put, use the, uh, uh, keep the weeds down along the fence lines and stuff. Uh, in turn, when I was at McGuire Air Force Base, uh, and Mac, my last air assignment, uh, I went into a second career field. And that was financial services, educating people on the subject of money. Uh, did that for 18 years in my second career. And I'll get into that in a little bit more. But to answer your question, uh, in February of 1960, excuse me, 2001. Five minutes. Okay. I had 21 heart attacks in a three-week period of time. I was, had been, because of that, I had been exposed, had uh, ischemic heart disease. Compliments of Agent Orange. Uh, they said, get, ended up with a triple heart bypass. They said, get rid of the stress in your life. I was working 75 hours a week, running my own business uh, as such. And in turn, they, so I decided to retire. I'd built a big, big business. I had five other vice presidents uh, under me that I had built up and, and everything. I turned the whole business over to them, all my clients over to them. We moved out here to McGuire, or out to, uh, to Prescott, Arizona. Went through the VA, uh, through, uh, and that's where they confirmed that I had ischemic heart disease. 
A year ago, my heart failed again a little bit. I ended up with open heart surgery, uh, replaced an aortic valve, and my, as such, and another bypass. Uh, three months ago, I ended up on oxygen because I couldn't get my breath. Uh, I get very winded very sometimes. Take care of your health, kids. It's important. You're going to see a lot of guys coming back from uh, the Persian Gulf with uh, traumatic brain injuries and uh, the first Gulf War. They're going to they're going to have some a lot of problems too as they come, some of these things come back. They're going to come back and bite them 20 years from now. You just don't know. But these are some of the things that you run across when you when you serve your country. Would I do it again? Most definitely. I enjoyed my Air Force career. Uh, I've met a lot of people in life, and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And, uh, we, and uh, everybody I've talked to, they, they, they agree. They, I've had a great opportunity, and I enjoyed my career. But I would still volunteer out at the VA uh, two to three days a week, uh, giving back to my work with the guys. I work on the information desk. That's how I met Colonel Peoples. I get to tell people where to go. Uh, I go out on Thursday mornings with my Papillons, they're our therapy dogs. I get a chance to work with the folks in the nursing home and uh, they're therapy dogs, work with them. And I also work with the uh, Veterans History Project where I get to interview veterans, collect their stories for the Library of Congress. I've done 88 interviews now, like what you're doing here right now. So that's kind of my story. In a quick in a nutshell. We got about uh, three minutes. Any questions, guys? How about tell them about your bronze star? How'd you get that? Okay, I got that for what I was doing in in, uh, in Vietnam. Uh, basically, for the work I was doing there, I was in charge of a two and a half million dollar WS four thirty B weapon system uh, called the PPIF. I had the opportunity of working with that also over in England and Germany as such. Uh, the Air Force Accommodation Medal that I said was was for the work I had done at Virginia with that uh, weapon system, as such. And as I said, that was uh, for about a year, almost two years. We were doing that, and uh, with what? Because what we did at the time, we didn't know uh, that was going to be deployed over into Vietnam, and that saved a lot of people. That was a medium altitude panoramic camera, as such. So, but. Uh, uh, a lot of my medals that you saw, I don't know where they went to, but uh, <clears throat> so uh, anyway, these, these are the miniatures of those. Those go to the mistress, such. The little badge up there is an intelligence badge. I wasn't awarded that until later they came out with an huh. intelligence badge, but uh, that's why it's not my bag there. But. I'll just show them some of these. Uh, he's talking about the launches right here. Yeah. That's a minute man being launched, yes. <clears throat> Out of Vandenberg. How can you tell it's a minute man? You can't see it in this one, but usually right above that, you'll see a smoke ring. It, that's the signature of the minute man, because it, it's down in the hole. When it ignites, it's a solid state. It blows its own smoke ring, and then it usually comes up right through it. Usually, sometimes you'll see one or two of them going off simultaneous. <laughs> And those will, as I say, we will travel we'll five times. Huh? What decided what call was the name? Why did they call them Minute Man? Uh, great question. I don't know. It only took about a minute for them to respond from the time you get the minute to the uh, uh, authentication order to the time they were launching. I mean, it was it was high pressure at the time. You had a you get a minute later. Oh, sorry, sorry. there are, there are, we're counting down. You go through it. We had uh, three different uh, three ring binders with uh, all our procedures in there. You just go go through them, checklists, checking things off. And, uh, I have an authenticated message. I have an authenticated message. I concur. Key hands in keys, keys inserted, enabled. Uh, command codes in the enable command. Missiles at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten are enabled. They're spinning up. They're getting ready to launch. My deputy's over there looking at all the, the lights, and he can tell exactly what the status of them are. 
and in turn they uh, we went we'd go through this launch sequence and uh, we'd key turn on them another vote goes in the system we could tell with the, with the other commands that were the other uh, launch control centers key turning also and these things are spinning have you been to the uh, Titan missile museum? No, I've never been to the Titan museum. It's down below, you know, Tucson. It's a no. nice place. All right, any other question, guys? Cadet McGee, why don't we uh, finish up here, please, then? Flight. That's a hut. Dismissed. Okay, turn off the recordings over there, please. Everybody thank Mr. John Long. Turn the recording off, just close the channel, close the thing. Thank you so much for coming and speaking to us. Thank you. Sorry, I got off. That's okay, that's right. Thank you for coming. Wish I had more time, but. <laughs> How do you give 20 years of... <laughs> I've been all down.